There's so many things about life that make us feel unsteady, that, that rock our boat, that, that lead us to, to, to want to grab, to hold on to something to steady us. And, and there's so many times I feel like this personally. Just, just Tuesday night, I, I was leaving midweek, and I looked at my phone, and I got this text message that just literally took my breath away. You know that feeling? You just, just feel deflated. And I felt my stomach start to turn, and physically felt wobbly. And I'm trying to like rationalize my thoughts and my fears and what I'm feeling. And I go home and I, I know I need to pray. So I'm like praying on my drive home. And you know when you're praying, but you can't still steady yourself because your mind's racing too much about what you're thinking and what you're fearing. And I got home and I'm like, I need to read my Bible. I need to do something to steady me. But still, as I'm reading, my, my thoughts are racing and I'm having trouble focusing on, on the text in front of me. And I'm like, I'm just unsteady. Remember trying to go to bed. You know that feeling when you're trying to go to bed, but you can't shut off your heart and you can't shut off your mind? That unsteady feeling. There's so many things. I, a few weeks ago, Christina had this allergic reaction to some medicine she was taking. And it was right before the congregational. And she, she got steady enough physically, but my fear was still racing. I remember trying to sit in church and, and focus and go to a leader's meeting and try to focus, try to be given. But when your heart's so unsteady, your, your mind races with fears. I, we feel unsteady physically at times. I, December was a bad month for me. I got chronic sinus issues. And I got this sinus infection that wouldn't go away. Like, one round of antibiotics didn't do it. Then a second round of antibiotics paired up with some steroids finally calmed down the infection. I went into the new year pretty unsteady physically. There's so many things that can make us feel unsteady. Sometimes it's the small things that add up, isn't it? It's the check engine light. It's your phone not working. It's, it's your email getting whacked. Are you missing something at work or forgetting your lunch and then the line? Like there's little things that add up that can make our hearts race and feel unsteady. Sometimes it's big things. Like someone you really love who's hurting and struggling and, and you care so much for them that it, it rocks your world. Sometimes finances that are tight, un, unexpected bills come. You know, special missions is coming up. What? That, that can stress us out. Maybe you didn't get the tax return you were planning on. Maybe you're one of those few unlucky people that owe this year. Things add up and make us feel unsteady. Stress from work. You know, this battles inside of us, like depression and anxiety. It can make us feel so unsteady. Disappointments with life, physical pain. These things add up in our lives. It could be conflict at work, conflict with your friends, conflict with your spouse, with your children, it makes us feel unsteady. The New Testament writers give us some vivid imagery of what it looks like and what it feels like when we're unsteady. It talks about being tossed back and forth by the wind and the waves. That when we feel unsteady, it's this, we're, we're like this boat that's getting rocked and pushed and driven by, by the wind and by the waves. And when we feel this way, it's so hard to steady ourselves. But there's a reason for our emotions. There's a reason why we feel so much in our lives. And what we're going to study out this morning is what makes us unsteady. Because if we've got to understand what, what, what rocks our boat, what makes us feel unsteady. Then we've got to understand how can we steady ourselves with God. Because there's so many emotions and feelings that are normal in life that you can't avoid in life. But how do we steady ourselves with our relationship with God that we can persevere through the different storms that are going to come our way? Because if you're not in one now, there's bound to be something coming soon that's going to make you just feel unsteady. First thing we're going to look at is that trials make us unsteady. We don't like trials. We don't like discomfort. But they sure do rock our worlds and they make us feel unsteady and uneasy. But there's a purpose to this. In James chapter 1 and verse 2, James writes, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you're faced with trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously without finding fault. And it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. 
Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Trials make us unsteady. James, he's addressing the persecuted and, and, and dispersed Jewish converts to Christianity. He's, he's addressing them. He's trying to help them to take courage and take heart in these trials that are coming their way. And there was a lot of persecution being dealt out by the Roman Empire. And they were facing the blunt of this. And he tells them trials are designed and they're supposed to make you feel unsteady, uneasy. And they're supposed to be approached with pure joy. No, let's be honest. Trials are rarely approached with pure joy, aren't they? That's, that's a hard little two words to, to, to digest and really trust. But trials are part of God's plan for helping us to mature and grow. It tests our faith. It, it tests our perseverance. It tests our doubt. It tests kind of what's in our tank, our faith tank. And we, we fight through our trials and this unsteady feelings that we have. The outcome is maturity and growth, which is ultimately what we all want as we make it through the rest of our lives. The problem is when we feel unsteady, though, there's side effects that come from not feeling stable emotionally or physically or spiritually. There's, there's side effects that come from that. And one of the biggest side effects is doubt. Isn't it true? A trial hits, something hits you, something's going on in your life that, that makes you feel unsteady and doubt starts to sink in. Instead of trusting in God, his plan and his promises, we start to doubt God, his plans, his word, his promises. And instead of trusting, doubt comes in and it creeps in. And what's hard is we're, we're disciples, we're Christians, so we know how to deal with it. So we kind of go through the motions. We'll, we'll pray but we'll pray and still have doubt in our hearts so we don't feel resolved. We'll ask for help. We'll, we'll reach out, but yet the doubt holds us back from truly following through with what we should know, what we know we should do next. We believe enough to do the Christian things, the disciple things that we know, but we doubt enough to not trust them. And it's this weird battle that we face as Christians when trials and unsteady things hit us because we know what we should do and we know what we feel and we know what we doubt. And it all mixes together. Doubt ultimately leads us to feeling unsteady. And we get tossed back and forth by the wind and by the waves of life. I don't know about you, but when I feel unsteady in a boat, my, my initial reaction is to abandon ship. Like, let's end this thing. Let's get off this roller coaster as soon as possible. Like, my dad and I hate flying on planes. If it starts getting unsteady, we're just like, take me to another place. Like, land this plane. We get so desperate. We want a quick fix. We want something to end this roller coaster, this tossing and turning that we're feeling. But in life, you can't just wish it and it goes away. It stays. And if we quit, we don't let perseverance finish its work in us. And we don't grow the way that God's intending us. We don't really become these men and women that God is calling us to be. This eternal feeling to, to stop, to, to shrink back, to, to give up, to hit pause. It's a real battle that we face with these challenges that we have. But the problem is when we give up, we never really know the final outcome for our lives. So the men and women that we could have become when we persevere through challenges. James uses this vivid imagery of being tossed back and forth by waves. How many people have been in a boat when the sea has gotten rough? Okay, it is an awful, awful feeling, especially if you're uh, motion sensitive, which I am. I had this brilliant plan about eight years ago to go on this fishing adventure with some of my four best friends up in like the Spinney Mountain 11 mile reservoir area. And this is like in November. In November in the high country, the weather can go crazy. It can rain, it can storm, it can hail, anything can happen. It, we had this great plan to go out on this lake. And I have my little inflatable pontoon boat. It's a one-seater, right? And then my friend Nick, he had a boat, which wasn't a very, I don't know, it wasn't considered a fishing boat. It's like from the 70s, but it worked. It floated. And he had three of his friends in that boat. And we're out fishing on Spinning Mountain Reservoir. And I'm paddling out, I'm fishing, I'm having a good time. They're blowing past me in their motorboat and trying to fish, but... Who caught the most fish that day? I, I, I was doing really good. But just then, as we're out fishing and having a good time, the weather changes. And it got really weird. It would be like pitch black. 
And then this intense sunlight would shine through. Then it'd be pitch black and the sunlight would come through. And this wind, you know when the wind starts to change directions? So it's going one way all day, then all of a sudden it's blowing you another way. You know something bad is coming. And the wind starts changing. And then we start hearing thunder off in the distance. And before we knew it, it literally felt like in a moment, we're, we're caught up in a storm. And the wind is blowing all these different directions. And the thunder and lightning is right over us. They turn on their boat like, Brian, we're getting out of here. And I'm like, I, I should probably get out of here. But right then, I hook into Moby Dick. I kid you not. This is, I've been fishing my whole life. This is probably one of the largest trout I have ever hooked in in my life. And I'm literally being moved by it. It doesn't take much to move the pontoon boat because this floats on top. But I'm being moved around and the storm's coming in. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm fighting this fish. I look over my shoulder. I kid you not. There's like a cyclone like starting on the lake. And it's snowing. It's hailing, it's lightning, like hair sticking up. And I'm fighting this fish. I'm like, I've never been one to give up. But everything in me is like, Brian, you got to flee. You got to get out of this situation. They're already going in yelling at me. And I'm trying to paddle and like fight this fish, get close to shore. And finally, I'm like, that's it. I've never done this before. I just yank, break the line. And I paddle as fast as I can back to the shoreline. At the shoreline up the hill was this permanent porta potty. And I'm like, I got to get there as quick as possible. This is going down. And I, I, I get to the shore. I put down my rods. I kick off my flippers. I run as fast as I can. And as I'm about 20 yards from this permanent porta potty area, this guy in this really brand new SUV pulls up. He's like, get in, man. I jump into his truck and he's like, look at the storm. I watched your whole experience. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you were watching? He says, yeah, it was phenomenal. Your friends left, but you were fighting this fish and you were going for it. You didn't quit, but then you got scared. And, and when you got scared, I started driving over to you. And I was like, thank you. Thank you. This is, this is way better than a porta potty to be sitting in your SUV right now. But I felt so much and so much fear. But once I got in that, he, he even had heated seats. You know, sitting in that, I was like, whoa. This is an extreme example, but doesn't life make us feel that way? Like you're on a boat and you're being tossed and turned and blown. There's not much you can do to direct your path. That's what we really feel. That's what James is trying to describe. That's what happens when we start to doubt, when we get unsteady in life. We get tossed around. And you gotta, believe, you gotta understand, God has this on this testing lake called earth. And there's wind and waves that blow. And it's not more than you can bear. He's not going to let you face a storm that's going to break you or end you. He says he won't let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But he will let you be tempted. He will let you face trials and storms in life that are going to rock you. They're going to test your faith. They're going to test your perseverance. They're going to test your belief. And they're going to test your doubt. And it's designed to make us feel uncomfortable, to humble us, to make us feel desperate. And if you fight those feelings, the storm is going to keep coming. And we have two outcomes when we feel unsteady to trials. We can either doubt or we can either persevere. And the problem with doubt is it leads us pedaling towards shore, towards the nearest porta potty. And that's not a very fun place to be. See, when you doubt, you're tempted to quit. And when you quit once, you're temp it makes it easier to quit the next time. That's the biggest lie about quitting is you think it will end. But the problem is it actually gets prolonged because if you quit once, it's that much easier to quit again. And when you doubt, it leads to quitting and giving up on God and his plan. On the other hand, when you persevere, it leads to trusting in God. And it helps you overcome your doubt and your temptations. Perseverance it says it completes us. It molds us. It shapes us into the men and women that God is calling us and designing us to be. Perseverance makes you stronger. It makes you ready for your next unsteady experience. It'll help you steady you faster. Perseverance is like, it's like graduating. It's like going to another grade. When you get through a trial through perseverance, you're that much stronger and that much more prepared for the next unsteady trial that comes your way. And it gives you the patience to wait for God to either rescue you or to end the trial. Because those are the two outcomes if you persevere. God intervenes and saves you, or God ends it. 
But we got to hold out until that happens in our lives. Do you kind of see this vicious cycle that James is talking about? Between faith and doubt and perseverance and the storm that comes with each one. The problem isn't the trials in life. The problem is how we respond to our trials. We respond with perseverance or we respond with doubt. That really determines the outcome of the man or woman that you become. But James called them to fight when they feel like flying. To fight, to persevere when everything else in them doubts, questions, and wants to run away. The beautiful thing about perseverance is the outcome. James says, if you can just persevere, you'll mature. You'll grow. You'll be made complete. Isn't that a cool picture that God can make us complete through perseverance? And he says the outcome also makes you crazy. You know how it makes you crazy? Because you actually start to appreciate trials. And you even consider them pure joy. And that is crazy to the world. But for disciples, you know it's these trials that make you grow and we want to grow. So we start to appreciate them, value them, trust them. When you look back on your Christianity, especially those who are, I'm talking like, you're going on three decades here. When you look back on your life, isn't it the trials that helped you to grow the most? That shaped you, that formed you into the man and woman that you are today? It's those trials that make you and who God is calling you to be. And so you become grateful for them. You understand that the next trial that comes, it won't last forever. It will end. And you can persevere and that you can make it. And that's the beauty about perseverance. God has used the last eight months in Christine and I's life to refine us, to mature us, to grow us. Eight months ago, some of our best friends stepped down from leading the Boulder Campus Ministry. And there was this big change. We were asked to lead Boulder and Denver. We were asked to help disciple and train the interns in Grand Junction. And it was a big honor. We got to become a part of the campus committee. But we, we had this large amount of responsibility, which was a huge honor. We're really grateful for it. But it, it shook up our lives. We're driving down the Boulder two or three times a week and, and still leading our group in Denver. And God just blessed it. He's like, you know what? You guys feel stretched. I'm just going to help other people to step up. We had our most fruitful fall. We had 19 people become Christians over the fall. God just like blew it out of the water. But you got to believe that came with its own stretching and challenges, right? For everybody. I, I was finishing my graduate degree last fall. Uh, we're trying to raise up new leaders, trying interns for the first time. Like, how are we going to do this? It was a really big training and testing time. And in these last eight months, I, I felt unsteady. I felt desperate. I felt really humbled. But I also felt like God was amazing me and moving. And in those eight months, we've already seen 25. That we've had a great spring too. And, and God's been molding and moving. But man, I, I, feel, I feel stretched. Very stretched. The Bickles, who are like our awesome campus shepherds and elders, like, they're like, we need more help. I'm like, I need more help. Our leaders are like, we need more leaders. Our, our disciples in the ministry are like, we need more to say. I'm like, I know. We're, we're stretching. It's a good feeling because you, you feel surrendered that God's going to just rock it out. But man, you feel the weight of it. And that's a big, one of the big reasons that led us coming back home to the Southeast. And I'm so glad that the Denver campus joined the Southeast. And we purposely dispersed a bit today. So if someone's in your seat, that was on purpose. Like, we, we want to meet you. We want to mingle with you. We need your faith. We need your years of perseverance. The campus needs the adults and we want to be mentors and we want to help out the teens. We want your friendships because we need to be giving to you guys. We, we need the Southeast. And if I can be really honest and appeal to you, we need help. We, we need you. We need your spouse. We need your Bible talk to adopt a campus Bible talk. We need you to be willing to mentor, just meet up for coffee and help out a college student. Like get to know them, mingle in the fellowship. Get to know each other. They need your faith. They need your experience. They need your example. We need help. And I'm grateful for those who've helped out. I mean, the Montines have had so many meals at the house. The Burtons, the Lovitz, the Hogans, the Connors, the Hesses. So many people have been wrapping their arms around the campus and I'm grateful for that. Can I, I'd like to ask, please continue to do so in increasing measure. We, we, we respect you and we need your guys' help. And 
it could be shepherding. It could be mentoring. It could be, hey, once a semester, I'll have a Bible talk over for lunch. Anything like that. It goes a long ways. If, if you want to help out or interested in how you can help out, you can talk to Greg Bickle or I after service or send us an email or text us. Like we're really eager to, to find connections between the campus and, and, and the adults, the singles and marrieds and in the teens. We're really eager to do that. But when I look back on these past eight months, I'm grateful for the trial. I'm grateful for the unsteady feelings. I am. And I, and I feel a little crazy. Sometimes I look at Christine, and I'm like, honey, this is good. And we're like, we're crazy. <laughs> like, what are we doing? We're crazy. But God moved. People stepped up. That's what we want. And I just, I keep learning the sooner I embrace trials and unsteadiness, the sooner I'm going to grow. The faster I'm going to become the man that God's called me to be. And honestly, the more glory God's going to get on this earth. So we can't fight these trials. We can't fight these unsteady feelings. You guys with me there? All right. All right. The second transition here, the second kind of point is when we're unsteady, we're vulnerable. Have you ever noticed that when you're unsteady, you're vulnerable and not always vulnerable in the best way. You could be negatively influenced, you get irrational thoughts and feelings. And to give us a visual, I'm going to have these guys bring them down this table. I need a teen, a campus student, a single, and a married who wants to volunteer for a little game, Okay. If you get motion sickness, this game is not for you. All right, Alex from campus. I need a guy from the teens. All right, come on down. Oh, Elijah's right there. All right, I need a single. Okay, come on down. I need a married. All right, Alex Haley. All right, let's do this. So uh, what we're going to do is you have to spin around 10 times. I'll count. And then the first to spin around 10 times and stack. We have four in the base. And then you got to stack it all the way up into a pyramid. Okay. Whoever does this first, but very disoriented, wins the challenge. You have, are you having cold feet? Are you good? You good? All right. I'll give you the, the advantage to the married man. Okay. Uh, so... All right, gather. Well, let's get you in front. You're going to be on the honor count. We're going to spin around 10 times. The whole crowd's going to count. Okay? We'll begin in three, two, one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, begin. You can grab him right here. Oh, how'd she do that? How did she do that? All right, let's give it up. Let's give it up for everybody. (laughs) Okay. When life gets discombobulated, you don't think rationally. You don't move rationally. And you feel very unsteady. Thank, thank you for being unsteady for all of us to get a little visual there. But you understand, when you're unsteady, you're vulnerable to making decisions you wouldn't otherwise make. You're hesitant. You're, you're confused. You're, you're disoriented. This is what happens when we're unsteady. It says in Ephesians 4 verse 14, Then they will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by the wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, they will grow to become every respect with the mature body of him who is the head, and that is Christ. Have you ever been around an infant? They're quite unstable, right? You watch them walk, they're like, whoa. They're easily distracted. You can like clap and do peekaboo when you're not even really disappearing. It's quite obvious, but they're easily manipulated. They're easily vulnerable to distractions and being quite unsteady. One moment they're laughing, the next moment they're crying. It's part of the reason why Christy and I don't have a child yet. No, I'm just kidding. Like we're waiting, we're waiting. We'll get there. We'll get there someday. But when you think about it, This is how we look when we're unsteady, though. Paul's saying, 
Don't be an infant who's tossed back and forth, who's immature. We could be like the small rudderless boat on an ocean that's being tossed back and forth by the waves when we're unsteady in life. When we're unsteady, we're vulnerable. We're not as coordinated, we're not as sound thinking. And we become vulnerable to be negatively influenced. And that's what he's talking about here in Ephesians. He says when you're unsteady, when you're unstable and tossed back and forth, there is a vulnerability that you are opened up to. To be manipulated and deceived by others, to be, to be manipulated and deceived by yourself. You make yourself vulnerable when you're unsteady in life. And there's a lot of things that can happen. When you're unsteady, you become vulnerable to false teaching. And I'm not talking like false teaching, like you're going to go join some radical movement. I'm talking like false teaching in the sense that you water down biblical truths. It, it can happen. You don't necessarily abandon true doctrine, but you do abandon the truth of the scriptures. Like for this one, confess and renounce your sins. You say, I'll stuff and tell someone later. Love one another as I have loved you. I'm going to love people the way I'm comfortable with loving people. Not even a hint of sexual morality or impurity. Well, I'll look at porn just as long as I don't cheat, I'm okay. We, our view of discipleship gets skewed. Go and make disciples of all nations. Well, I did that when I was younger. Or that's for those who are more outgoing than I am. We, we, we can water down Jesus' truth. Deny yourself daily and follow me. Well, as long as I look more Christ-like than other people at work or in class, then I think I've denied myself enough. Right? This is tempting. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Well, I love God, but I also love lots of other things that compete with my love for God. I love them, but maybe it's not with all my heart, soul, and strength. I mean, at one time I did. You see how we can kind of deceive ourselves and how this can happen? We can be manipulated by the world. This happens a lot. We believe money and stuff matters. You know that it's all going to burn? You can take nothing to judgment day, but your own soul. And hopefully a lot of other souls that you impacted on this earth. But everything else, your car, your house, it all burns. And this world makes us believe that our stuff actually matters. What matters is our relationship with God. We can deceive ourselves, be manipulated by the world, by our righteousness being blurred, right? By the music we listen to, by the shows we laugh at, what we find funny at work, our our devotion to the Denver Broncos. I love the Broncos. But you know what I mean? The world can blur our righteousness, our modesty, our speech. The world can really blur our convictions. The world can blur our convictions with our hobbies. I love fishing. I love hunting. I love doing active things. But the world tells me that's my source for joy. Instead of God being my source of joy. You see how that can be blurred and manipulated by the world? We can deceive ourselves. I think I'm the best liar to myself. I can convince myself of many false things in my life. I can convince myself that that person doesn't love me. I can deceive myself in becoming critical and bitter towards people at work, in my, in my ministry, in my life, my family. Like, I, I can deceive myself. We can deceive ourselves to thinking that our trials aren't worth persevering through. It's just better to stop and to quit. We can deceive ourselves into thinking we're not good enough. We're not pretty enough. God does not love us enough. We can deceive ourselves into thinking we're not smart enough, that we're not valuable, and just deceive ourselves. We can fall into the trap of the evil one. Sin looks really appealing when you're unsteady, doesn't it? This quick fix, this instant pleasure, this thing that's going to give you a little break in your, in your mind and in your thinking. It's so easy to think that sin's this quick fix, but it really leads down a darker road. Satan loves to make us promises when we feel unsteady. If you just do this, you're going to feel better. But instead, it's this empty promise that robs you of joy. Satan loves to deceive us. He loves to feed us our pride. Man, our pride is like our morning Cheerio sometimes when we're unsteady. We just think, I got to withdraw from people. People don't understand me. People aren't going to get me. Satan loves to deceive us in this way. Don't we all feel vulnerable when we're unsteady? Doesn't this resonate that you just, yeah, you do. When you feel unsteady, you feel vulnerable. Paul says, you know what the antidote, you know what the key, you know what stabilizes someone? Truth. He says, speak the truth to one another. 
Truth is the total contrast to unsteady thinking. Truth. It, there's a lot of power in truth. He says, when we speak the truth and love to each other, you grow, the person who spoke to you grow, and the whole church grows. This is really God's key to church growth, is us speaking the truth and love to one another. This is God's plan for stabilizing and steadying our crazy lives. It's truth. This was Jesus' plan all along, was truth. The Jews that had believed in him, he, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Can't you just picture Jesus singing the lyrics that k Sam was singing? If you love me, don't let go. Hold on. Hold on to my teachings. Hold on to me. Because you're a little unsteady now. You're a little unsteady now. Like, don't you just see that Jesus is saying, like, man, if you can just hold on to my teachings, if you can hold on to my truth, I can steady you, I can stable you, and I can set you free. That's the power of God's truth, Jesus' truth in our lives. When we hold to Jesus' teaching, we get set free from our unsteadiness, from our sin, from our anxieties, from our fears, from our deception. And we get protected by God. See, when you seek the truth, it steadies you. You think about the truth that comes from reading your Bible and having, knowing that you have God's word. That, that the steadiness that comes from a prayer life where you can pour out anything to God, say anything to him, and he loves you and views you the same way. The fact that we can be truthful with our brothers and sisters and honest and vulnerable, if we seek that type of truth in our lives, that's how you get steadied. That's how you get through trust. That's how you make it in Christianity is seeking and loving the truth. I'm, I'm so grateful for the people who've spoken the truth to me. I mean, my dad's here tonight. My dad's been speaking truth to me since I was a little wee lad. Like, I'm grateful for his truth in my life. I'm grateful to even to see both Greg sitting next to him, just great men who've mentored me. I, I'm grateful for my students, my leaders, my wife, like my friends, people who just love me enough to tell me the truth when I need to hear it. And when I don't want to hear it, we need that too. I, I'm grateful to watch how people grow when they really embrace truth. You know, when you see someone who really embraces truth, it's like they have multiple spiritual birthdays in a moment. No, Rick is this way in the campus. He's been a disciple for two and a half years. But man, this guy loves the truth. He loves to be discipled. He loves to get the truth. He loves correction. He just wants to grow. And man, he'll take it from Greg Bickle will take it from me. He'll take it from the guys he's discipling. It does not matter. He loves truth and he's grown so much. And he's been so faithful and fruitful in his campus experience. He graduates in December and wants to go into full-time ministry. It's only possible, not because he's so great, because he just loves the truth. And God's like, you give me someone who loves the truth, I'll raise that person up. And it's the truth. You, you do that in your marriage. You do that with your family. You do that with your friends. You'll watch people around you grow and flourish and be steady in life. This really happens. It, another side to this, though, is when you see others unsteady, it's our responsibility to speak the truth. Right? When you see your friends, or especially in the teens, unsteady, there's a lot of emotions as a teenager. Do you love them enough to speak the truth? To say what they need to hear? When you're on campus in your workplace, do you love your coworkers, care about them enough to speak the truth to them? When you're at home with your wife, with your husband, with your children, and you see them unsteady, do you speak the truth in love? It's not just the truth, it's in love. It's, it's I love you, it's in a loving way, but I'm, I love you so much, I'm gonna say the truth as well. When we do that, the church grows. You grow. And I, I'm guilty, and I think we can all feel guilty of just, right? It's so much easier to look the other way when you see an unsteady person be like, I hope somebody else talks to them. Maybe you've even done that this morning, right? You see someone on a meltdown, you're like, that's a hot mess. I'm, I'm, somebody else speak the truth in love. Like, it happens. Imagine how different your Bible talk would be. Your ministry could be. If we just all love receiving the truth and speaking the truth in love to one another. This is how we really grow. Feeling unsteady is a part of life. Trials challenge our faith. That's life. That's, that's Christianity. But it's designed by God to help us to grow and to help us to flourish. If we don't embrace this, you won't grow. And actually, you won't like Christianity very much. 
But honestly, you won't like life very much because whether you're a Christian or not, you're going to have trials. And thank God for Jesus that we have Jesus for all our trials and all our unsteadiness to come and that we have a church that loves us, to help us. Man, we are so lucky in this way. And I'm ultimately so grateful for Jesus. Jesus was not perfect. He, I mean, he was perfect as in he was sinless. But he had emotions too. There's times he got unsteady. There's times his, his life got rocked. And what a more vivid picture than in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before he is killed. He's in the garden. He's praying. He's on his knees crying out to God, feeling overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He's unsteady. He's emotional. He's crying. He's feeling. His body is shutting down. He's feeling so much. But we have a Lord who's gone before us, who rose and went through the torture, the shame, the trials, suffered emotional pain, physical pain, spiritual pain, died on the cross and scored the shame of sin for us? You want to talk about someone who steadied himself so that we could follow in his example? Is that not Jesus? Is that not the cross? Is that not what we're called to remember each week for communion? To remember how Jesus joyfully chose to pay the price that we should have paid. And at this time, we're going to pray for our communion and to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection. But I think today, let's focus more on his, how he steadied himself for your sake and endured so much pain so that we could have a relationship with God. That, that's amazing. Let's pray to Jesus now and, and to God and just and get, set our hearts for communion. God, thank you so much that you gave us Jesus, that he is you in the flesh, that we got to see how he dealt with trials and unsteadiness and his emotions and all that stuff that we can imitate, that we can follow in his footsteps. Ultimately, thank you so much for helping him to be perfect, to go to the cross, to, to pay the price we should have paid and that we have that to look forward to, that that's our light, that's our anchor, that's our hope is what Jesus has done, that you're calling us the rest of the days of our lives to follow him and to follow him up to glory, to be with you one day forever, for all eternity. God, I know we all eagerly await that, but we may have days, we may have weeks, we may have years before we get there. And I, I pray that this morning we can just be inspired by Jesus in the sacrifice and, and the hope that that brings us for our lives, the hope that when we feel unsteady, steady, we can be steadied by you and by your son. 